Today we're going to be learning about projectiles. So in this section we'll be looking at what is a projectile and later on how to mathematically, mathematically model a projectile. To begin with, we'll just be learning about trajectories and the idea of what is a projectile and what is a trajectory. So a projectile is simply an object that is, has been dropped or launched into the air. We can see a few projectiles over here. Uh, a swimmer in midair about to dive into the water. Uh, a golf ball being hit by a golf club. Or a bullet after being fired from a gun. They are then left to complete their unpowered flight. For the purposes of the HSC, objects that have uh, a source of power, such as a rocket, do not count as projectiles. Projectiles must be unpowered. So we can think of a few more examples of projectiles, I'm sure. You might think of a falling apple. There's no source of power there. Or a bolt fired from a crossbow. Or perhaps a coin being flipped. None of these are powered, so all of them count as projectiles. The only significant force acting on a projectile, ignoring things like air resistance, is gravitational force, right? There's nothing powering it, and there's always gravity, so that gravity will be pulling it down with gravitational acceleration. Projectiles near the Earth will accelerate downwards at 9.8 meters per second per second. Because there is only one force acting, gravity, a projectile is relatively easy to model. We don't have to worry about forces like air resistance or, you know, thrust or drag or anything like that. So a trajectory is the path that a projectile follows, right? It tends to be curved, like what we can see over here. So the path of any object undergoing constant acceleration whether that acceleration is due to gravity or otherwise, is going to be in a parabola, right? So what does that say about the trajectory, which is the path that a, uh, that a projectile follows? Well, projectiles always go constant acceleration due to gravity, which means that they'll move in a parabola. So trajectories are always parabolic. The acceleration of any object does not depend on its mass, right? We've gone through this. Gravitational force is proportional to mass. Acceleration is proportional to mass. Therefore, uh, acceleration will be constant for gravitational force. So that means the trajectory of any object only depends on its initial velocity and not its mass. Two objects of different masses launched at the same time for example, dropped off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, will follow the same trajectory. The easiest way to describe a projectile is to separate its velocity into two different components. And because we're physicists and we're allowed to describe stuff mathematically, it's something that we're allowed to do. So one component of motion will be horizontal, and the other will be, of course, vertical. So how do these two components relate to the original velocity? Well, vector addition. I hope you remember how to do that. Vector addition looks something like this. If we take a horizontal vector and a vertical vector, we can add them together to form the total vector. So the vectors of the projectile velocity and its components form a right angle triangle. We can see that the horizontal component of velocity can be found with uh, Vx for horizontal component equals uh, V, so the hypotenuse, times the cosine of theta, right? So if we have the initial velocity vector, both magnitude and direction, we can use that to figure out the horizontal component of its motion. Right, so what about the vertical one? Well, that will, of course, be vy equals v sine theta. These, this is the way that you find out the adjacent and opposite sides of any right angle triangle. So they'll hold true for our vector addition. Now if we use vector addition to add together the components, we can find the total velocity. 
This is good if we know how the components are going to change, but not necessarily how the total vector is going to change. It means that by modeling the changes to the components of motion, we can figure out how the total motion will change. So the magnitude of velocity will be the same as adding any right angle triangle together. It will simply be the length of the hypotenuse. We know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That is, the two shorter sides of a right angle triangle can be squared and added together to form the square of the hypotenuse. So if we take the square root of both sides, we can see that the magnitude of the total velocity will be given by this expression here. That's all well and good, but what about the angle? Now remember, we have a right angle triangle, right? We have an angle theta. We know two sides, and we know trigonometry. So what expression can we give to relate these three quantities together? Well, I'll give that to you. Tan of theta equals, that's right, opposite over adjacent, which will be Vy over Vx. So if we wanted to make theta the subject of the equation, what would our equation look like? I'll give you a chance to write it down while I rub this off. Yeah, exactly right. It's uh, theta equals tan minus 1 Vy over Vx. So this will give us the angle of the uh, total velocity. So the object has to accelerate downwards, right? That's gravitational acceleration. So the vertical component of the motion will change over time. We can see the vertical component of the motion modeled on uh, the left side of this blue line. We can see that it starts off fairly slow, but it speeds up as it gets down to the bottom of the image. Gravitational force does not act horizontally there. So what does this mean for the horizontal component of motion? Well, as I'm sure you can see, the horizontal component of motion is constant. It does not change. For the entire journey of the projectile, the horizontal motion does not change unless we start to consider things like air resistance and drag and things like that. For the purposes of the HSC, we won't worry about that, and horizontal motion is always constant. This is because if we have a force acting in a different direction, it will not affect uh, that component of motion. So that's the end of the theory. In this section, we've learned about uh, how to describe motion in terms of the components uh, in the vertical and horizontal direction. And we've talked about how they can be affected by gravity. So let's go on to some questions. Question one, which is correct? Either the velocity of the projectile is at its highest point is zero, the velocity of the projectile is always changing, the direction of the projectile's acceleration changes when it reaches its highest point, and the acceleration of the ball at its highest point is zero. Now right away we can see that D is wrong because the acceleration on a projectile is going to be constant. It's going to be the force of gravity. Our correct answer is not A because uh, the velocity of the projectile at its highest point might be zero in one component of its motion, but if we're launched with a constant horizontal velocity, we're going to keep that constant velocity. So our velocity will never quite be zero. The direction of the projectile's acceleration does not change because gravitational acceleration is constant. The direction of its velocity changes as it stops moving up and starts moving down. As I said, the acceleration is constant, so it does not ever reach zero. Uh, the velocity of its vertical component of velocity might reach zero. But our correct answer for this question is in fact B. For the velocity of the projectile is always changing. And the reason for this is that both the direction is always changing as it moves in an arc, and the magnitude is always changing as gravity is affecting it. Remember, as long as we have an acceleration, in this case constant gravitational acceleration, we will have a changing velocity. Question two.
Classify each of the following as projectiles or non-projectiles. A pencil falling off a desk. All right, well, let's think about this. We have one force acting on the object, gravity, and we have it in midair, so it's a projectile. So a pencil falling off a desk is a projectile. B, a rocket being launched. Now let's see, we have gravity acting on it, and it's in midair, which is good, but that's not the only force acting on it. We also have thrust. So the engine is a force that alters uh, the path of the rocket, uh, so it's a non-projectile. If we were to shut off the engines completely, such as if it was halfway to the moon and we didn't need the engines anymore, then it would become a projectile as it flies from the Earth to the moon, completely unpowered. C, a pendulum swinging back and forth. Now we have a pendulum, and it's in midair, and gravity is acting on it, but we have a tension force pulling it toward the pivot. So this tension force prevents it from becoming a projectile. Finally, an arrow fired from a bow. Now let's see, that's got gravity acting on it, uh, it's in midair, uh, it doesn't have any tension force or thrust, so it must be a projectile. Question 3, part A. What property of an object's vertical motion is constant and non-zero? So an object's vertical motion depends on its initial uh, velocity and the force of gravity on it, right? So it turns out that the acceleration due to gravity is constant, as we know, and it's non-zero. So the vertical acceleration of the object is at a constant 9.81 meters per second. And the direction, of course, is downwards. Part B. What property of an object's horizontal motion is constant and non-zero? So it turns out that horizontal motion has more than one constant. It has constant acceleration of zero, uh, but that won't answer the question. In fact, the constant answer here is probably its horizontal velocity. The horizontal velocity isn't affected by gravity. And in fact, if it's a true projectile and there are no forces acting on it other than gravity, then the horizontal motion of the object will be constant and usually non-zero. Question four, what is this diagram illustrating? We can see we, here we have some sort of a parabola with uh, vertical and horizontal lines being drawn to a number of reference points in the parabola. So let's take a closer look at this. If we look at, the if we look at all the points on the horizontal axis, we can see that they're equally spaced, right? But if we look at the points on the vertical axis, we can see that they start off a fairly far apart, but they get closer and closer and closer until they're almost touching right at the top. So what could this be trying to illustrate given that we've just been talking about trajectories and projectiles? Well, it's probably safe to assume that this is indicating a trajectory, right? So what are these lines for? Well, it's to do with the distances between them. It shows that the horizontal component of a projectile's motion will be constant, so these are all equidistant, and the vertical component will change, so the distance between these lines will change as the projectile's motion changes. Question 5. Does the time of flight of a projectile depend on its horizontal motion or its vertical motion? Explain your answer. So assuming that we're not throwing something off a cliff or up to a ledge, we can assume that the ground is going to be in the same uh, position at, uh, everywhere in the situation, right? Uh, so we don't need to worry about horizontal motion at all. Why is that? The time of flight begins when the projectile is launched and ends when it lands on the ground, right? So where it is from the ground is a measure of vertical position. Landing on the ground is a measure of its vertical position, which depends on its vertical velocity and its vertical acceleration, but not its horizontal velocity or its horizontal acceleration. 
the horizontal component of the projectile's motion is constant and does not affect the time it takes for the projectile to reach the ground. As I mentioned before, the exception to this is if you're throwing something and you're fairly close to a cliff, or if you have sufficient horizontal motion, it'll fall off the cliff. But as long as you don't throw it too far, it'll only be a measure of the vertical motion. Well, uh, that's the end of the questions. So in this section, we've uh, talked about how we can model the motion of an object that's uh, traveling in a parabola. These objects are called projectiles, and their paths are called trajectories. Thank you.